Thank you, Jonathan, for a very kind introduction, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I'm delighted to be in Idaho. As you know, I've, I'm responsible for one of the hot potatoes that have been tossed around of late, the response to the IACI task force report. And I know you probably you saw me on television. I've been on, I flew in on, uh, on Wednesday night and uh, on Thursday I was submitted to a battery of, of uh, TV interviews and news conferences and all kinds of things. So and two of them are going to be shown on Sunday, two interviews that were done by your local station. So if you want to tune in and watch them, you might, you might enjoy some of the pyrotechnics. Uh, the interesting thing in all of this is that I made a recommendation in my study, in my critique. I said, I pointed out that the uh, IACI group had offered a public sector solution. That was the only solution they offered the people of Idaho. Public sector solution to a, to a, what they would consider a public sector a problem. But education, you know, belongs to more than just the state. It's everyone's concern. And uh, I, had, I suggested that since private schools in this country provide quality education at no cost to the taxpayer, wow, listen to that, no cost to the taxpayer, why not try a little more of it in Idaho? And so I suggested that perhaps the state might divest itself of some of these institutions of higher learning that are having such problems. And of course that has caused a tremendous stir. Everybody's asked me about it. One newspaper that was a uh, clipping of which was sent to me said that I wanted all the schools closed in Idaho. Another one, another uh, columnist said that I wanted to sell it to the highest bidder on the auction block, you know, and make them into profit-making uh, profit companies. Of course, there's a famous profit-making school in Iowa, that, uh, a college that uh, did so well and it got the establishment so upset that they had to close it and get rid of the president because he was making so much money and doing so much good. I don't know if you remember that. That was in the 60s sometime. A very famous college, I think it was called Fairfield or was in Fairfield, Iowa. I forget now, it's, it's some years ago. But it has been tried. I mean, we have thousands of private schools all over the country that, that pay their own way, that deliver quality education, that are no burden to the taxpayer, and you would wonder why don't they follow that example? It's so simple. It's so obvious. It's like the example of East and West Berlin. You know, you see capitalism and socialism. It's so obvious. Which is the better system? Or Hong Kong and Red China? Or Seoul and South Korea and Pyongyang and North Korea? You, I mean, the contrast is so obvious that uh, it defies the, uh, the imagination to wonder why these people don't bother to go in that direction. But of course we know why. We have an educational establishment that has grown fat off the taxpayer and grown fat off the state, and they just will not give an inch. As a matter of fact, they intend to, they would like to get rid of every private school in the country if possible. More than 10 years ago, uh, in 1970, I wrote a book called uh, How to Start Your Own Private School and Why You Need One. And in researching that book, I took a trip down to the South to visit all of these new private academies that had sprung up as a result of forced busing. There were a lot of parents who did not want to put their children on buses and send them into high crime neighborhoods for a so-called education, you know. And while one may question the motives of the parents who created these schools, uh, I wanted to find out for myself how these schools were doing. And what I did was I, I, I simply read all of the horribly hostile articles about them and I took down the names of the schools and I said, I'm going to visit all of these schools and find out for myself uh, whether they're good, bad, whether they are, quote, segregation academies, whether they're run by, by sinister people who want to build the community and, and take off with the funds and and go to Brazil or something like that. That was the impression you got or whether these uh, schools were going to fold, fold up their tents and disappear in the night and that sort of thing. 
And I made a tour of the South. I started in Virginia. I went to the famous uh, 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 St. George, uh, Prince George County private school, the first one that was started in this country. I visited all of these schools and I was absolutely amazed at what the parents of, of uh, and, and the responsible citizens of those different communities had done. They had built what I would consider to be excellent, some better than others naturally, but excellent schools compared to what the, public's, uh, the public was being offered by the, by the state. And I said to myself, gee, this is a story that has not been told. This is the best kept secret in America, is the success of the Southern private schools. And so I wrote about him in my book. That was 14 years ago. You know, to this day, there has not been a single study by all of the educational researchers, and I can, I can tell you that there are thousands and thousands of them with PhDs and MAs and you name it, who have not bothered to look into the success of that system to find out why it's successful and to find out what these schools are doing, even from a derogatory point of view. They have completely ignored them as if they don't exist. And that's what they do, that's what they do with the private sector in general. They would like to wish it away. And more than just wish it away, because if you know anything about the National Education Association, they have big plans to uh, get rid of private education, first by requiring certification of all private schools by the state, requiring the certification of all teachers in private schools, in Christian schools. Can you imagine a certified teacher teaching in a Christian school, that is a teacher who has been through the teachers' colleges trained by these professors of education, totally brainwashed, than going into a Christian school. And they want to control it, complete control of the profession. This is the direction that the teachers of America are going. Not all the teachers, but their organization, the NEA. They're going toward a totalitarian system of education in this country. Well, a couple of months ago, I was uh, asked to uh, suggest that perhaps I might do a little book about the, the NEA. And so I've started working on it. But, but before I talk more about that, I want to say this. That in this entire discussion, uh, all of the discussions I've had here in, um, in Boise and in, in, uh, in Idaho and uh, with the various, with the press, et cetera, and even with Mr. Clute, who is the, uh, who is the chairman of the task force, the uh, question of quality, the quality of education, was never really discussed. They all jumped on the divestiture business because that was an easy target and you could get a lot of mileage out of that. And so we weren't really able to discuss the whole business of the quality of education. And I thought to myself, the, the task force people said that quality is a very hard thing to define. You cannot define quality education. All they know is that we don't have it. They don't know what it is, but they know we don't have it. Their solution, of course, is to build a system of community colleges to pick up the poor functional illiterates who are being discharged from the primary and secondary schools. Somehow they feel that a system of community colleges will do what the elementary and secondary college, uh, schools can't do, that is provide the quality. And I thought to myself, you know, the reason why they have, nobody can define quality in this, uh, the quality of education in this country and why we're having so much trouble is that nobody wants to, to define their philosophy of education. You see, if you want to go into a school and you want to determine its quality or what's wrong with it, ask the educators, well, what is your philosophy of education? You'll get 90% of your answer about the quality when you find out what their philosophy is. Because usually the, their philosophy will tell you what they're doing and why they're doing it and why they're getting the results they are. Now, whether you know it or not, whether the public knows it or not, American education is run by a philosophy of education. There's no doubt about it. When I started working on this book on the NEA, 
I suspected, you know, I'd heard a lot about, you know, John Dewey and the rest and progressive education and all of that, but I had rather vague ideas as to what was involved. I knew that Dewey was a socialist, but uh, I couldn't believe that American teachers are socialists or what. And uh, it was hard for me to put my finger on exactly what was wrong. I, I knew that there was a terrible reading problem. I had done an, a great deal of research in that area. I knew that, uh, that the methods of teaching reading in this country were changed in the early, were changed in the early part of the century and then were brought into the schools in the 1930s and the 1940s. I had been taught by phonics. I, I had been taught in a school that that the valued literacy, I had been taught to read well, and I was required to read difficult books. So at least in the early 30s in New York City, I was uh, given what I would consider a decent education, but in, in the late 30s and the early 40s, of course, you had that complete change over from phonics to the look-say method, that is the whole word method. Even though the educators knew that the system was producing low literacy, was producing problems, was producing functional literates, dyslexics, the reading disabled, all of these horrible new uh, uh, conditions that never existed before this. Other things were happening at the same time. For example, Harvard University was, was founded in 1645, it's over 300 years ago. And they didn't create a graduate school of education until 1920. That's a long time to go without, you know, thinking of education as a subject to be concerned with. Well, they created a graduate school of education, and other universities did, and they began creating all of these professors of education, these PhDs, by the thousands, by the hundreds and then the thousands. And since then, education has just gone downhill. The more PhDs you get, the worse the situation gets. It's interesting, up to, the po up to that point when we started flooding the country with PhDs, who incidentally get most of their income from the government, you know, through government subsidies, state, state universities, and uh, grant research grants, they're all involved in research up to here, but they still haven't found out how to teach children to read, you know. Although we knew it for 3,000 years, we've known it for 3,000 years how to teach children to read. Never been a secret, it's no big secret. But the professors didn't know. And so you begin to ask yourself, is, do they really don't know what they're doing? I mean, could, are they that ignorant? All these PhDs and PhDs, all these professors with these big titles and how you know, they couldn't possibly be that ignorant, could they? And I've come to the conclusion that they're not ignorant. They know exactly what they're doing. And that every time the, 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 the figure of functional literates gets higher, they applaud. They're delighted. That's exactly what they want. They want to reduce this nation to a bunch of low literates. And John Dewey said it, and, and I was surprised myself to find that John Dewey actually set the, uh, the, uh, the philosophy for all this. He said that high literacy produced individualistic intelligence, selfish intelligence, and that therefore you had to get rid of individualistic intelligence to have socialism. High literacy to John Dewey was an obstacle to socialism. It's as simple as that. And the only way you could do that, and the only way you could get rid of high literacy was to use this new method of teaching children to read. And so if they want to get rid of high literacy, they certainly have done it. They certainly have, have, uh, have uh, attained their goal. Because not, and, and the interesting thing is no matter what you do, it's impossible to change the system. Rudolf Flesch wrote his book, Why Johnny Can't Read, in 19... 55. How many years ago is that? And at that time, he told us, he said, look, all over America you're teaching, you're teaching children the wrong way. 
You're, te you're using the most illogic method of teaching reading ever invented. And the professors of education, well, John, uh, they just said, well, flesh, Rudolf Flesh doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he's, he's ill-informed, he's misrepresenting us. He knew exactly what he was doing. Flesh was right. And they were wrong. But of course, in a sense, they were right too, because they knew what they were doing. They wanted low literacy, but they didn't want the American people to know that that's exactly what they wanted. They put it in other terms. They said they wanted to socialize the, the youngsters. They wanted to make them uh, more uh, amenable to social adjustment, that sort of thing, so that they could be softened up for, um, for a socialist state or for a socialist society. And uh, I have a quote that, and then in 1981, Rudolf Flesch wrote another book called Why Johnny Still Can't Read. <laughs> you see. And he said, 25 years ago I studied American methods of teaching reading and warned against educational catastrophe. Now it has arrived. After almost 70 years of research, after 124 studies leaving look and say without a shred of scientific respectability, it is still used in 85% of our classrooms, poisoning the minds and crippling the educational growth of tens of millions of children. The educators have ignored this mountain of solid evidence and continued their program retardation in our schools. So he knows it, we know it, you know it, so many people know it, and yet they go on their merry way. And the reason why this, things cannot be changed is because of a very interesting marriage that took place at the turn of the century. Prior to, uh, the marriage was between behavioral psychology and education. The marriage took place in Leipzig, Germany, at the University of Leipzig, under the blessings of Wilhelm Wundt, the great German professor of psychology. And the marriage was consummated at Teachers College, Columbia, the University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins University, practically in every university in the United States. Because what that marriage did was it elevated education to the university status. Prior to that, Education was a subject on a much lower level. It was taught in something called a normal school. I don't know how many have ever heard of a normal school. And uh, the normal school was for teacher training. It was like a teacher's seminary. Prior to that, before there were even normal schools, teachers were trained in academies. And academies, you might say, were, on, were certainly not on the college level. They were the high, they were the high schools of that time. So teachers were trained in the academies and then they went to the normal schools. Then suddenly they were catapulted into the universities because of the, of the marriage between behavioral psychology and education. Now why is that a very important turning point in our history? Because prior to that, psychology uh, was the, really the study of the intellect. It was a division of philosophy. And it was concerned about the mind, about the intellect. But with the coming of behavioral psychology, the focus turned to the laboratory, the psych lab, behavior, you know, studying reflex time, reaction time, uh, how fast it takes for the, for the uh, impulse to go in the sciatic nerve from here to there. And they used, of course, uh, vivisection, live animals, and all sorts of things in Germany to, uh, to determine these new wonderful things. They were going to apply all of the scientific method, they were going to apply the scientific method to psychology. And uh, this, and uh, one of the first, um, the first American to get a PhD in psychology at, at uh, the University of Leipzig under Wilhelm Wundt was G. Stanley Hall. He came to the United States and he was John Dewey's teacher. He came back, worked at John's, became a professor at Johns Hopkins. 
And uh, he and others then began, there was a, began a regular shuttle between the United States and Leipzig of all of these new young uh, aspiring scientists who were going to reform education in the name of behavioral psychology. Now the important part of behavioral psychology was, first of all, it was based on evolution. They all believed in evolution. They all believed that man was just another animal, a little more complicated, but just another animal, and that uh, he could be studied like the animals. And uh, there's a, there's a the, the uh, theory of evolution had a tremendous impact on these people because many of them were struggling with religion and they wanted some kind of way out. They wanted some way of, of, uh, of uh, how would you say, of, no, they wanted to find a, 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 a means of explaining existence without God. And so, of course, evolution gave them that explanation. And uh, they just took to it like ducks to water. This is what they had been looking for. And so they began to study man as they do the animals. And we had G. Stanley Hall coming back, then James McKean Cattell, who while he was in Leipzig did these experiments with reaction time in the reading of words and letters. And he said that, well, adults could read words as fast as they could read letters, therefore let's teach the children to read whole words instead of you know, bothering with the letters altogether. We'll just go on to whole words. And then came, um, and, th and uh, Cattell became a professor. He was one of the founders of Teachers College, Columbia. And then came Thorndike, Edward L. Thorndike, who began doing his experiments with animals. And who decided that he could apply what he had learned about animals to human beings. And I want to just read you some quotes from him in case you have any doubts as to Thorndike, who became the most influential man in this field, the most influential man in this field, and who revolutionized education, because after that all, all pedagogy was based on his findings. He said, he wrote a book called Animal Intelligence in 1911, and he said, we, ha we are here alongside the foundations of mental life. And this hitherto unsuspected law of animal mind may prevail in human mind to an extent hitherto unknown. The best way with children may often be, in the pompous words of an animal trainer, quote, to arrange everything in connection with the trick so that the animal will be compelled by the laws of its own nature to perform it, unquote. That's just a summing up of his ideas about how to train children. Then he said, Nowhere more truly than in his mental capacities is man a part of nature. His instincts, that is, his inborn tendencies to feel and act in certain ways, show throughout marks of kinship with the lower animals, especially with our nearest relatives, the monkeys. His sense powers show no new creation. His sense powers show no new creation. His intellect we have seen to be a simple though expanded variation from the general animal sort. In other words, the human mind is just a simple though expanded, extended variation, sorry. This again is presaged by the, by the similar variation in the case of the monkeys. Amongst the minds of animals, that of man leads not as a demigod from another planet, but as a king from the same race. In other words, man is just the king of the animals. I thought the lion was the king of the animals, but apparently we've, we've displaced the lion. He must feel pretty bad, you know, that we are now the king of the animals, you see. And he said further, comparative psychology should use the phenomenon of the monkey mind of today to find out what the primitive mind from which man's sprung off was like. 
In other words, he said, well, man's mind must have been like the monkeys way back then because it's all evolution, you see. And therefore, our mind must have developed the way the monkey's mind developed. Well, uh, concurrent with Thorndike came uh, John Broadus Watson, the, uh, the behaviorist psychologist who decided, well, not only does man not have a mind, he certainly doesn't have a soul. You know, you can't see the soul, you can't measure the soul. And psychology has to, con has to concern itself only what can be seen, touched, felt, and measured. So let's throw out the soul. We throw out the mind, throw out the soul. And what do you have, you know? Then Skinner comes along. And Skinner is in the same tradition. He just, each one of these psychologists goes a little further than the other. You know, it's really amazing that they, uh, that they don't seem to learn. You get this feeling that they, they have this incredible strong need to deny the existence of God and to the, deny the, the, their own ability to conceive of God. He says, Skinner says, I may say the only differences I expect to see revealed between the behavior of rat and man, this is a rat and man, now he's comparing the two, aside from enormous differences of complexity, lie in the field of verbal behavior. In other words, the only difference between a rat and a man is that we can speak and the rats can't, you see. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the latest, that was Skinner's latest. And that's what he believes today, of course. And Skinner is considered today the, you know, demigod of the psychology world. If you ask anybody, who is America's greatest psychologist? Who is it? B.F. Skinner. You can't even think of any other name. I mean, the man is the celebrity, and yet he equates man with, with a rat and thinks very little about any other aspect of, of our mental or spiritual life. Well, what things, but wait a minute. We aren't there yet. We haven't quite reached the end of the line on this. Here's Discover Magazine. Discover Magazine is that popular magazine about science put out by Time, Inc. And they had an article in July 1983 on, on all of the new findings, uh, you know, the studies of chimpanzees and missing links and all of that. And they said, says anthropologist Vincent Sarich, whose work has sparked much of the debate, quote, people go to the zoo and see their close anatomical kinship with chimpanzees, but they refuse to face up to the implications of that. In other words, you're, you're expected to go up to the chimpanzee and say, hi, cousin, hi, hi guy, you know, <laughs> come on to dinner, you know. <laughs> David Pilbeam of Harvard, one of the country's foremost paleoanthropologists, uh, paleo that is science, scientists who use fossil evidence to study human evolution, puts the case more succinctly. We should no longer say that we are descended from apes, he says. We are apes. That's it. There isn't even any difference than we are apes. You know, just about, act like an ape, you know. <laughs> Why do you think the kids in American schools call them zoos? Why do you think they behave the way they do, like animals? Because they've been told and taught that they're animals. If it's drummed into your head that you're like an ape, you begin to say, well, act like an ape. And what do apes do? Well, all you have to do is go to the zoo and watch. Or go to the school and watch. So now you have, you know, teenage pregnancy, you have Ten-year-old girls getting pregnant, they're doing what animals do, you see. You have them going on drugs and alcohol, why? Because they're told that they have no minds, but the human mind is a very strange thing. It keeps impinging. It says, I'm here, I'm here. You have a mind, I'm here. But they've been told by their teachers they have no mind. So what do they do? They have to shut out the mind. And the only way you can shut the mind out is through drugs and alcohol. Then you mesmerize it. You know, you flood it with alcohol and drugs and 
you can get rid of your mind, you see. The human mind will not let people, it will not let a human being alone. And for a very important reason, you see. We are different from the animals, you see. We were created by a, crea uh, by a creator, you see. And we are accountable to our creators. And when the creator created us, he provided a means whereby we can link up with the Holy Spirit. And that's what is called the, the human spirit. The human spirit was made in, so that it can create and form a direct relationship with the Holy Spirit. That is the main difference between human beings and animals. Now the psychologists and the educators today tell the children, your link is not upward toward God, your link is downward toward the apes and the monkeys. And that's where you belong and that's what the children look at. They're denied their God-given ability to reach upward to the Supreme Being, to their Creator. And so if you say, what is the difference between a public school and a Christian school? There's every difference in the world. In a Christian school, a youngster is told, you were created by God. You are a human being. You are accountable to your Creator. Well, a child who is told that and believes that and understands that does not behave like a monkey. You see. And so if you ask, what's wrong with American education? There it is. It's the stranglehold, it's the death grip that behavioral psychology has on the education system of this country, and it is a stranglehold which cannot be broken. It's impossible. There are too many PhDs, PhDs, you name it. They control it from top to bottom. They control the writing of textbooks. They control the curriculum. They control the reason. They are the ones. They decide what kind of literacy we're going to have. Well, you're getting the literacy that monkeys have. You know, they're trying to teach monkeys to read. They're experimenting with them to see how many words chimpanzees can learn. Why should human beings read any better than chimpanzees? You know, that's their point of view. And so when you, when you hear this, 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 this argument, this, when, you, when you hear this discussion, this debate between creationism and evolution, they want you to believe that it's just something that's being taught in a biology class. There's just an argument about how shall we teach biology? But it's much deeper than that. The theory of evolution pervades the entire system. It is its underpinning. It's the very basis of the pedagogy. It's the basis of how the books are written. It's the basis of how the curriculum is decided. It's the basis of social studies. It's the basis of how the reading is taught. It's the basis of the content of all of these, of these books. And that's why they, they are so sensitive about this business of creationism and evolution, you see. Whenever, whenever you, you try to get creationism into the schools, the whole educational establishment rises up and says, no, keep it out, because to them, that is religion. And of course, they want to destroy religion. And of course, they want to destroy the Christian schools. Now you can see why it's impossible for a Christian school to hire a certified teacher. Because a certified teacher goes through that elaborate training of behavioral science, of behavioral psychology. All American teachers go through that nonsense. They all go through that diabolical training. They all do. And that's what certification means. And that's what they're going to try and shove down the throats of everyone in this country. And that is why I respect and praise and admire the people in Louisville, Nebraska, who, who have stood up to the powers that be and refused to accept certified teachers 
or state certification or anything because when you know what your enemies are up to, you know, you can be sure that they're, they mean what they say. You have to take them seriously. It's interesting, today I was invited to a Rotary Club meeting and I had the pleasure of meeting uh, the, the state superintendent of schools of, uh, of Idaho, Mr. Evans. Charming gentleman. Very nice. And in con conversing with him at the end, I, I said to him, I said, you know, we were discussing the NEA. I said, you know, the NEA wants all private schools to be certified and, and, and all of that. And he said, well, he says, you know, we have a state law in which it says that all schools in Idaho have to be certified and have to use certified teachers. He says, but we don't, he says there's no penalty involved and we don't bother about it and we don't, uh, you know, we don't uh, enforce it. But I thought to myself, yeah, at first it made me feel a little good that, you know, it's not being enforced, I said, but the law is on the books. And one of these days when they feel confident enough they may decide to enforce that law. So we have a long struggle ahead of us if we want to preserve educational freedom in this country, if we want to uh, maintain educational sanity. But as I said at the beginning, if you want to know why the quality of education is the way it is, examine the philosophy of education in this country. And if you know the philosophy of education in this country, then you have no doubt why the schools are doing what they're doing and producing the failures they're producing. This is, it's been planned that way. That's what they want. That's a sign of their success, you see. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, 24 million functional literates is not enough for them. They want 50 million. And they're going to get it because they're creating all these community colleges which do nothing to alleviate the situation. If they wanted high literacy in this country tomorrow, they could have it. They could have it. We had it a hundred years ago. We had it fifty years ago. There's no secret. It's no mystery how to create high literacy. There are schools that are create private schools that are uh, that are permitting youngsters to gain high literacy. They can have it. It's there, but they don't want it. And there's nothing that there's no reform that they can that they can offer that's going to change that. None whatever. I can't think of a single one. Particularly this IACI report which simply or recommendations which simply wants you to keep financing this kind of, 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 well, nonsense or evil. It's more evil than nonsense. Nonsense you can joke about, but you cannot joke about lives that are being destroyed by this system. Why do we have the, high, uh, the highest suicide rate among teenagers now? Why do you read about murders, ritual murders, committed by teenagers? I remember reading about one in California a year or two ago, a hideous murder of this young high school student who murdered his girlfriend and then brought his friends over to see the body, things like that. I mean, why in this greatest nation on earth will we spend more money on education than any nation in the history of the world? The more money we spend the more garbage we're getting, you see. So it's a very, very serious problem, and I couldn't begin to address it in my response to the IACI task force. I tried to offer some, some suggestions that, you know, might head them off at the pass, so to speak, might prevent them from you know, spreading the disease even further. But they're all preventive measures. The only way that you can possibly protect your children today in this environment is to get them out from under those influences. You simply have to remove your children from those schools and put them in schools, in private schools that you yourselves can trust 
You yourselves know are dedicated to teaching these children to read, to become literate, to become wholesome, moral, upright human beings, not animals. So I hope, and, and uh, the book I'm doing now will contain a good deal of this. Much of this is, the, is what I've told tonight is the result of just recent research that I've done only in the past couple of months and going through all of this material and find I just couldn't believe what I was finding. I couldn't believe that I was finding this confirmation to everything that I had suspected but could not, but had never seen documented anywhere. But it's all there. These men have all stated what they wanted to do. Dewey said it in many places, you know. But people don't bother to read him these days because it's dull reading. Matter of fact, education in general is dull reading. It's a dull subject. And that's why they get away with murder. You see, they can get away with murder because it's so dull, nobody wants to be bothered with it. But uh, I found it a bit exciting because to me it's like a, a mystery and you become a kind of detective when you become a, that kind of an investigative writer, historical writer, and you come across interesting things that you never expected to find. In any case, I guess I've told you enough to uh, uh, give you some food for thought. And uh, maybe I'll read you a bit of what I've written, just some of it, to give you an idea. Let me, for example, just read you Lawrence Kremen, professor of education at Teachers College, a historian, did a book called Transformation of the School. And here he describes Thorndike's conduct. He says, it was at Harvard that Thorndike undertook his first work with animal learning, a course of experimentation destined profoundly to influence the American school. He began investigating instinctive and intelligent behavior in chickens, a line of research so novel that he was refused space to experiment at the university and had to undertake his research in the basement of the James House in Cambridge, that is the house of William James, the great psychologist. A fellowship from Columbia brought Thorndike to New York to study with James McKean Cattell. He continued the experiments he had begun at Harvard and in 1898 produced a dissertation on animal intelligence which stands as a landmark in the history of psychology. It's a landmark. What was the nature of the experiments? Basically, they involved an animal in a problem box, a situation in which a specific behavior, like pressing down a lever, was rewarded with escape from the box and a bit of food. The animal was placed in the box, and after a period of random activity, it pressed the lever and received the reward. In subsequent trials, the period between the animals being introduced into the situation and the pressing of the lever decreased to a point at which introduction into the box occasioned a lunge at the lever and the conclusion of the experiment. That's what's known as animal learning, you see. Thorndike called the process by which the animals tended to repeat ever more efficiently and economically behaviors which were rewarded learning. And out of his experiment came a new theory of learning and a new law founded on that theory. The theory maintained that learning involves the wedding of a specific response to a specific stimulus through a physiological bond in the neural system so that the stimulus regularly calls forth the response. In Thorndike's word, words, the bond between S and R, that is stimulus and response, is stamped in by being continually rewarded. And from this follows what Thorndike called the law of effect, namely that a satisfactory outcome of any response tends to stamp in its connection with a given situation and conversely, 
that an unsatisfactory outcome tends to stamp out the bond or connection. Whereas previous theories had emphasized practice or rep repetition, that is the old drill business, Thorndike gave equal weight to outcomes, to success or failure, reward or punishment, satisfaction or annoyance to the learner. Thorndike's experiment inaugurated the laboratory study of animal learning, assuming that a demonstration of the conditions of animal behavior under laboratory conditions could help solve the general problems of psychology. The assumption, of course, represents a synthesis of scientific method and evolutionary doctrine, since the absence of the latter, animal learning would hardly have been considered a suitable topic for a psychologist. In other words, it was evolution which made animal learning a suitable topic. Equally important, perhaps, Thorndike's new law implied a new theory of mind. Building on the idea of the reflex arc, which connected the brain and neural tissue with the total behavior of the organism, he ended the search for mind by eliminating it as a separate entity. Mind appeared in the total response of the organism to its environment. As Thorndike later pointed out in his classic three-volume work, Educational Psychology, which was read by all of the teachers at that time, they were trained in it, this conception does more than render psychology a science by making it the study of observable, measurable human behavior. In one fell swoop, it discards the biblical view of man's, that man's nature as a uh, is a, as essentially sinful and hence untrustworthy. The Rousseauan view that man's nature is essentially good and hence always right. And the Lockean view that man's nature is ultimately plastic and hence completely modifiable. Human nature, Thorndike maintained, is simply a mass of original tendencies that can be exploited for good or bad depending on, on what learning takes place. And that's how Kremen des describes what Thorndike's great uh, contributions to learning. It's interesting that if you want to study how children learn, you watch chickens. I don't quite get that. If you want to know how the human mind works, you don't ask human beings, you don't ask children, you watch chickens and rats and monkeys. That's supposed to tell you. You know, human beings can talk. Why didn't Thorndike ask human beings? Why didn't he go up to a child? How do you learn, youngster? He never bothered. Never bothered to ask human beings how they learn. Simply assumed, and, and of course the animals never told him how they learn, did they? Because they can't talk. Isn't that a peculiar way to, to try to find out how humans learn? Is to study animals who can't talk and to forget about human beings who can talk. You know. But this, they were so absolute, as it says here, the most important line, it discards the biblical view that man's nature is essentially sinful. And that was what they wanted to get rid of. This notion that man had to account to a supreme being. They wanted the freedom, freedom from God. And evolution gave it to them. And they didn't care what they had to do with the rest of the world in order to enjoy that. It's interesting, they, they cannot simply enjoy it by themselves. They want to convert everybody else to it or destroy everyone else who has other ideas. That's the mentality you're dealing with. And it's a very, very difficult mentality to, to reason with. You know, we like to think that educators are reasonable people, that they will listen to reason. And parents have gone from one superintendent to another, and they've gone to professors, and they've gone to their teachers, and they've asked, and they've tried, why can't you do this, why can't you do that? And nothing ever gets done, they don't know why. They don't know what's wrong, they don't know why they're not getting through. Well, this is the reason why. All of the professors today were the graduates of these schools, these are their mentors. Thorndike was the one who taught Arthur Gates, everything you knew, and Arthur Gates was the one who created the Macmillan Readers. Thorndike taught William Scott Gray 
everything he knew. And you know what William Scott Gray is responsible for? Dick and Jane. And the Dick and Jane methodology is based on Thorndike's SNR. Go, go, go. Watch, watch, watch. Look, look, look. Run, 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 you know. See Jane run. See Dick run. See Spot run. See Spot sit. <laughs> the whole works. You know, great literature. <laughs> but that's what it is. In any case, these are some of the things that are happening today, and I hope that uh, when the book is out that you will all rush to your bookstores and buy lots of copies and send it to your friends, etc. And so if you have any questions, I'll be very glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Before we take the questions, uh, I'd like to just say a couple things. Uh, number one, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Blumenfeld, for that uh, provocative uh, discussion from a vantage point that I myself had never heard here before, and I've heard it from several. And I want you to realize out there that uh, and it goes without saying that the Center for the Study of Market Alternatives does not necessarily endorse all the views of Mr. Blumenfeld. But more importantly, what we're seeking to do here tonight is to, is to bring about understanding and not conformity. Now I can look out in the audience here and I can see individuals that I imagine might be at swords points with uh, what uh, Mr. Blumenfeld has said. And, and that's fine. Uh, and so what I want to do now is I want to moderate uh, the question and answer time. We'll, we'll take probably about uh, about 15 minutes, all right? And then we'll, we'll adjourn. Okay, and I'll repeat the question then. Uh, well, I haven't come up and respond to it. Maurice? Mr. Blumenfeld, um, I think that uh, what I gather in your uh, intent here is to provide some sort of basis for proving that there is a conspiracy. And what I want to know is do you actually believe that my sixth grade teacher in Napa, uh, Lone Star School, is actually in a conspiracy to try to prevent me from running out of the room. Let me repeat the question, but not only for your sake, because I'm sure you've heard them pretty well, but for the camera that's staring at us in the back of the room. The question was, uh, it sounds like it's a conspiratorial theory that you're giving us, uh, and that uh, that seems far-fetched when I think of the local school teacher that uh, is training my child. Uh, right here in Napa, or in Caldwell, or in Boise. And do you really think, Mr. Blumenfeld, that, uh, that they are part of this conspiracy? Well, you know, the average teacher really does not know this. I didn't know it until I started doing research on it, so why should they know it? And they're even told less. When they're trained, they're simply trained by their I, for example, when, a, when an 18 year old college graduate goes into a college of education, a teacher's college, she doesn't know very much about how reading is taught. She accepts what her professors tell her. They tell her to teach a sight vocabulary. She says, gee, that sounds great. That sounds okay. She's given a colorful textbook with beautiful pictures and little kids running around and Popeye and Donald Duck and <coughs> Mickey Mouse and all of that. And it looks great. And the kids love it and all kinds of animals are put all over the room. You know, uh, have you ever been to the modern school today? There are no pictures of George Washington. Only pictures of Mickey Mouse and this animal and that one and Donald Duck. I mean, way up into the third and fourth grades. And they think this is wonderful. And, you know, they're not involved in any conspiracy. This is the way they're taught. And they have no reason to doubt the integrity 
of their professors and their teachers. Many of whom are just doing the same thing because that's the way they've been taught. That's the way the textbooks tell them to teach. It's not that they, you see, all, but some of them do begin to say to themselves, gee, why am I having so many failures in my class? Why are so many kids not being able to learn to read? And so they may attend a special school that teaches phonics. They may have heard that there's such a thing as phonics, you know, they've heard of it. They are not involved in this in that kind of conspiratorial way. As a matter of fact, this is, this is not a conspiracy in that sense. This is not secret. There's nothing secret about this. It's all, what I read to you is published. I didn't read to you anything that I had to dig out of a safe anywhere. It's not available to the public. It's just general public uh, ignorance that permits us to do these things. For example, uh, if you don't tell anybody how capitalism works, they're going to have to find out for themselves. You know. If you don't tell anybody how to teach, if you don't tell any, a, a young teacher the right way to teach a child to read, they're not going to know it's as simple as that. But you have to understand how the profession is organized. And I wrote an, an article for Reason Magazine called The Victims of Dick and Jane, which was published in, in pamphlet form by America's Future, and, and it's available from the, uh, uh, from the center. And in it, I explained how the profession is organized and why nothing has been done in 25 years since Rudolf Fleck, and even before that, because the first man who actually said that Look Say was dangerous and could harm children and could destroy lives was Dr. Samuel T. Orton. He wrote an article for Educational Psychology magazine in 1929. You see, so he knew it in 1929, and the teachers, the professors, just went ahead and produced Dick and Jane. Dick and Jane didn't come out till 1931, and the same with the Macmillan readers and all these other readers. So they knew. In fact, the authoritative book on Look Say was published in 1908 by a student of James McKean Cattell. It's called the Psychology and Pedagogy of Reading. And in that book, it was written by a, a young man named uh, uh, Edmund Burke Huey, a young psychologist who had never taught anyone to read, who was simply doing some research for McKean, who wrote the book and then forgot about reading, never went back to it, wasn't interested in it, and died in 1914. And yet that book is considered the Bible of the reading establishment. That's their authority. And in that book, that very same book, Huey said, yes, children will misread with the look same method. Yeah, they're going to substitute one word for another. That's all right, though, he said. They're getting the meaning. So they knew even in 1908 that look say produced inaccurate, poor readers. They knew it in 1908. It was confirmed in 1929. It was told to them in 1955 by Rudolf Flesch. It was told to them again in 1981. How many times do you have to tell them? But if you want to know the facts, they're in this little pamphlet, they're available. I also did something called Why America Has a Reading Problem. When I first got involved in this thing, and, I will, and I'll have these over at the uh, center if you'd like to get them. Any other questions? How are the girls' schools? Do they get affected the same way? Okay, let me repeat the question. Before I do that, I was wondering, we now have Huey and Dewey, and I'm waiting for Louie. <laughs> uh, the, the, excuse me. The, uh, <laughs> the question was, uh, uh, how about the German schools, and are they today having the same problems in reading? Is that the, that's the question? Okay. Well, this, this method has been used in Europe. As a matter of fact, it's caused problems in England, it's caused problems in Australia, it's caused problems in, in uh, France, where there's been a decline in literacy among young people, the same sort of thing we have here. 
And as far as I know, in Germany, it was tried for a while, but then discarded. But it was causing so many problems that the Germans just decided that there was something wrong. You see, in these other countries, they don't quite have the, the kind of uh, setup that we have. And, uh, but I'm not, I'm not an authority on what's happening in Germany. That's only what I know from the top of my head. I, I remember reading one, one psychologist who said that they were having trouble in Germany when they tried to adopt this method. And of course, it's been exported all over the world because everybody thinks that what comes out of America is great. So Dick and Jane has been translated into all kinds of languages and the, and the methodology has been used and it's produced the expected result. But I can't really give you a definitive authoritative answer on that. If I could add to that, from a, uh, uh, we'll call it linguistic point of view, the, the orthographies or, or the uh, spelling systems of the European languages are nowhere near as ad hoc or as uh, as contrived and arbitrary and irregular as that of English. English is sort of in a class by itself uh, in the difficulties and uh, of irregularities in learning how to spell the language. The, the the German in particular is one of the best of of sound symbol correlation. All right. Is there another question, uh, Joe? Hey, do you um, really uh, implicitly believe that we can change our Latin problem in education by just teaching creationism or evolutionism, number one, and number two, do you think that a, a non-published private school that would be uh, non-Christian uh, or not necessarily Christian do an adequate job in providing education. Okay, the question is, uh, is the issue as simplistic as evolutionism versus creationism? And if the public schools went to a creationist base, would that solve all of our problems? And also, if there were a private school which uh, maintained a evolutionistic base, base to their teaching, uh, would they end up with the same kinds of problems that uh, the general malaise that we find in, in the public schools today? Well, uh, the evolution versus creationism uh, dispute is simply a symptom of what's happening. It's not really... It's, it's, it's looking at the issue from a, from a skew. I think you have to... Even if you, say, for example, had a school a private school which did not teach creationism. You could still have literacy. After all, there are some atheists who want to be able to read. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, one of the world's most uh, magnificent atheists, Ayn Rand, was one of the most literate people in the world, and she would have been all for looks at, I mean for phonics. That has really nothing to do with it. It's not whether you believe that evolution exists, it's whether you apply it your teaching method. Ayn Rand, as much of an atheist that she was, never believed that man was an animal. And I think she probably went along with the idea of evolution, you see. So you can find atheists who do uh, take a more traditional stand when it comes to the nature of human beings. She believed that man was a kind, you know, was perfectible. She romanticized it made man heroic, if you've read any of her, novel, uh, her novels. She elevated man into a god. As a matter of fact, that's what the Hegelians did, the followers of the, followers of the German philosopher Hegel, who was a pantheist. They believed that man was divine. So that's, that's, it's, it's uh, part of the problem, but it's not the whole problem, and certainly is not the solution to the problem. But it's a key to understanding the problem. That's the most important. It's the key to understanding. If you can understand that small aspect of it, then you can begin to understand all the other things that surround it. I understood it right. The, uh, certainly no remedy uh, that the 
public schools are somewhat beyond redemption, what do you offer as a solution? The question is quite simply, uh, uh, it doesn't seem as though Mr. Blumenfeld has uh, said that there's any hope at all in the public school system. What then is the remedy for the situation? Well, the only hope there is, of course, is that enough common sense prevails in the public schools among teachers. I know of many public school teachers who are wonderful people. They have helped me in my work. You know, they are on our side. They're in the system. So they're not, somehow they manage to get through the system without being contaminated by it or, or uh, warped by it. But, uh, and, and there are many youngsters who come out of the schools, the public schools, unscathed. That's fine. That may be 30%. Then you have the middle 30% who are troubled, have problems, uh, drift into drugs, they begin to worship rock stars, rock music becomes their, uh, their, their religion, they go to these pagan, you know, festivals and that sort of thing, then you have that 30%. And then on the very bottom you have the, the failures, the 30% who have failed. So, the, of course, the, the, not everyone fails because some people go into the schools with some, with something from their families, something from their homes, something, some substance. They go to church or they've been given values by their, parent, their parents that reinforce them so that they can question what they read in the textbooks. You know, we don't live in a totalitarian state, you see. So, as much power as the teachers have, as much power as the educators, I should see the educators, because it's the professors of education rather than the teachers on the lower level. As long as we don't have a totalitarian state, they cannot simply get everything they want. It's only a partial success for them. But if you say, but if you if you want me to, to offer hope, I mean, look at it this way. Would you fly an airline with a 30% failure rate? Would you buy a car from a manufacturer who had a 30% failure rate? You wouldn't, obviously. But we, send, we put our kids in schools with a 30% failure rate, you know. And there seems to be nothing we can do to, you know, stop it. I just simply think that we're in one of those stages in our history where, you know, sometimes you just can't see the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's like at the beginning of the Civil War. You can imagine how the people of this country felt at the beginning of the Civil War. The country was divided, armies were forming on both sides, and they had to go through five years of absolute hell in which 500,000, a half a million Americans slaughtered each other on this soil. They had to pass through that. And I believe we're entering that kind of turbulence, that kind of turbulent period in American educational history where these things are going to be sorted out by battles in Louisville, uh, Nebraska, battles in Idaho, battles all over the country, small battles, big battles, who knows what kind of battles, and we have no idea what the outcome is going to be. You just have to be prepared for it. You know, as they say, fasten your seat belts in the planes. Well, just fasten your seat belts. We're headed for additional trouble because the teachers, the, the professors are not going to give in. The teachers union, the NEA is not giving in. They want to control America. They already control the Democratic Party. They control Mr. Mondale, and if Gary Hart gets the nomination, they'll control him. They control. They want to control every legislature in the in every, in the 50 states. They have lobbies in each legislature, so they're not going away. I don't see any. Uh, you know, we're just beginning to understand what they're up to, and we're just going to begin to offer some resistance to them. So I, re I, I hate to, uh, you know, hold out some kind of false hope that this thing is going to blow over. We're just in for a, a long period of 
great troubles with education in which you are going to be persuaded to support it, to put more money into the schools, to raise your taxes, and, and as far as we can see, the, the situation is not going to get any better. And, and certainly the conflict between the two groups, you see, is going to grow more intense. And how it is going to be resolved, I really can't say. I don't know. Rudolf Flesch once told me in a private conversation, he said, he said, Sam, he says, you know, maybe this is part of the, the inevitable decline of America. He says, we've had Vietnam, we keep surrendering, we're losing to the, to the Reds all over the place, we give in, we're folding up, we can't get, you know, the, the people are divided, we retreat. He says, maybe this is just part of the general inner rot and destruction of this country. You see, maybe it is. I don't think it is. I think that once the American people, and I hope that I can do something to help wake them up. But I don't think it is. I think that uh, we're just at the beginning of a very long struggle. You know, other nations have gone through much worse. If you look at what Germany looked like in 1945, what Japan looked like in 1945, and what are they today? So, you know, you can go through periods of, of rack and ruin and then rise up from the ashes. And I think the American people, because there is a basic common sense in this country, and people are basically religious. I don't know how many of you watch the 700 Club, but I'll tell you one thing that this country has, which is really surprising. We have a number of uh, remarkably, incredibly good religious leaders who have come up. And you may not agree with me. You may not agree that Jerry Falwell is a great religious leader, but he is. Or Pat Robertson, who is creating the Christian Broadcasting Network and the satellites and television and all that. That's the way it's happening. Or Jimmy Swaggart or J. Vernon McGee. These are leaders that are, have risen. It's an amazing phenomenon. But perhaps the saving grace is, where are the leaders in public education? There are none. Where are the John Deweys? Where are the Thorndikes? Where are the Horace Manns? They're all dead. And who are the new leaders today? There isn't a one of them you can name. Name me one great public educational leader today. They're just riding along on momentum. On momentum fed by billions and billions from federal money and state money. You see. And so there's the, the hope. The, the hope is that leadership is arising, dynamic, marvelous leadership is arising on our side and there's no credible leadership on the other side. So that's, if there's any hope, that's, that, that would be it. But still there's going to be a battle because they control so much. If you understand the legislation, the web of laws, which keeps that whole establishment in power, and you begin to think, oh my God, how can we begin to start to even repeal any of them? You realize, uh, what kind of a, a, a problem it's going to be. But as I say, their lack of leadership is cause for hope because there's no decent leader can arrive out of such, such, such a sewer, such evil. I hate to use such terminology, but I get worked up occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for one more question if it's short. And if, the, and if the response is short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, my, my responses are as long as the speech. From your city of Boston. Yeah. Uh, Boston College, that's a Jesuit college. Yes. It's a Christian college. You know, there's only one question there. Is Tip O'Neill a graduate of Boston? <laughs> <laughs> the question is Tip O'Neill a uh, graduate of Boston College? <laughs> You know, I really don't know. I don't even think you went to college. <laughs> you see, I, I really don't know. We have a, a lot of fine people who have gone to Boston College. And That's right. I think it is Jesuit College. Oh, yes, it is Jesuit College. Most of the Catholic universities are run by Jesuits. And uh, 
they seem to do a good job, but there's been a tremendous liberalization among the Catholics in the community to the point where you have the bishops, you know, coming out on, on, on uh, nuclear freezes and things like that. And even among Catholics, you find a great division now, great, uh, great uh, struggles between the, the orthodox and the conservative and the new liberal wing that are trying to uh, overturn uh, the whole Catholic system. And it's, it's an interesting battle that's going on, but it's going on everywhere. But, I, but as I say, I think that the lack of leadership on the other side is, a, is good news. That could be the longest response to a yes or no question on, <laughs> on record. Uh, well, okay, one, one more, and this is the last. The question was, uh, there is no reason for the great depth of despair which seemed to come forward here because a study could be and should be made and uh, we ought to have someone that could step forward and do such a study. Is that the question? <clears throat> no, that's, that's a very, very good point as a matter of fact. Uh, but it's up to the people to do something about it. The parents who are creating Christian schools, Christian schools are being, uh, and private schools, oh, there's non-Christian are being created all over the country. That's positive. They are doing something. Uh, various parents are gathering in groups and protesting. They're becoming aware. That's positive, too. I don't want to give the impression that you can't do anything. I simply don't want to leave the impression that it's going to happen overnight, that it's something that can be done easily. I simply want to give you an idea of how deep the problem is that it's not something that get elected to the school board. That's going to do it. Well, the liberals have a wonderful, a wonderful way of just waiting for conservatives to get tired. And then the conservative leaves and the liberals are back in place. You see, they consider Reagan a, a, a temporary aberration. They figure, well, we'll weather that storm then when he's gone, we'll keep going. But hopefully it won't. As I say, there are many things that, that people can do. The simplest thing, the most direct thing, is simply to remove your child from the public school. If they don't have your children, boy, they're out of business. Right. That, you know, if every parent in America, or 80% of the parents, or even 50% of the parents, remove their kids out of the public schools, wow, what a manifestation that would be. You see. But how are you going to get the parents to do that? You see, you've got to convince them that by putting their kids into, a, into that kind of a school, they are taking an enormous risk that that kid may be permanently damaged for life. So I'm saying, yes, I don't want to leave the impression you can't do anything. I'm doing something. I'm writing, you see, and I'm bringing the facts to the public, and hopefully that will initiate and will encourage parents to do more and to speak up to become aware and to get others involved as well. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Tell them I'll, I'll be back and answer any questions. Okay, Brenda, uh, if you could. Okay, that announcement and several others, and then, I'll, then I will dismiss you. What are you saying, John? I am going to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, a library over at the center, 
of books that are both uh, for sale and then if you'd like to borrow one we have a permanent collection that you can uh, that you have access to and we want to make that available to you one of the new books that we just got last week there is called the public school monopoly it's the book that Brenda just referred to and that book is put out by uh, Pacific Institute it's a compendium about that fat uh, of articles written from a wide spectrum of ideological uh, presuppositions all the way from uh, anarcho-capitalist to uh, neo-Marxist, all right, and with the spectrum all the way in between. And it will give you a good basis to know what is happening, what has happened, and the trends which may happen in the future in the public school system. Now, in addition to that book, which is not for sale, unfortunately, we can give you the address if you like a copy, but you can look at the copy that is there. Uh, as uh, as Sam said, we have Victims of Dick and Jane, which are free for the taking, and I would recommend it for your reading. We also hope that each one of you will take home one of the brochures about the center. And uh, just to give a little plug for the center, we are here to provide public forums of uh, offering market alternatives to problems which we find in various aspects of our lives. Now, the public, the market alternative in the area of education is a simple one. Uh, we, want to re we want to loosen up the state monopoly on education in order that the genius of humanity can come up with creative solutions without scripture, without restraint by an educational establishment which seem to be restricting them. And we have that much faith in humanity that that would be possible if we had a free market for education. Enough of the other. <laughs> now, now, uh, also, I want to alert you to the fact that the two uh, interview shows, the two interview shows that uh, uh, Mr. Blumenfeld referred to will be Channel 2, 4.30 Sunday, 11 o'clock again Sunday night, and then Channel 6, 5 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, the Channel 6 show was an adversary situation in which uh, uh, Mr. John Clute, who was the chairman of the IAC task force, uh, was there with Mr. Blumenfeld in dialogue. And I think you'll enjoy that. Also, the Channel 2 representation was Mr. Blumenfeld all by himself with the news reporter. And that too, I think you'll find very interesting. Now, uh, not quite then. We have tomorrow night a dinner supper at the Mardi Gras. The meal begins at 7 o'clock. There's an attitude adjustment hour from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And then at approximately 8 o'clock, Mr. Blumenfeld will be beginning another lecture on the same general subject. So we invite you to that. The, uh, it costs $7.50 per plate, which is an owner-subsidized, not government subsidized price all right and then finally i do hope that you will go back over to not only because your cars are over there but because we do have refreshments at the center and there will be other people that you will find very interesting and entertaining to converse with and you dismiss thank you very much for coming tomorrow night's in voice at the mardi gras